Susan, thank you for today. Um, is, uh, I don't know if Pastor Jones is here from the church, uh, but thanks to the folks at the uh, River Hills Community Church for letting us use this facility uh, tonight, uh, to the Chamber for sponsoring this. And before I forget, because I've forgotten this in the past, I want to thank in advance uh, the folks from the York County Sheriff's Department who are here. Uh, they're here for a reason. They're here mostly to let you know that it is safe for you to be here. Uh, well, in all, in all seriousness, after what happened in Arizona uh, at the beginning of this year, we got briefed fairly, uh, in a very, fairly detailed fashion by the Capitol Hill Police, the folks that provide us with the police force, and they said that really the reaction amongst the Congress people was, was, was pretty subdued because we sort of know that that can happen to us. It's part of the job. But what really they were finding is that people were afraid to come to the events because they were afraid for their children, they were afraid that something might go wrong. So I wanted to thank the York County Sheriff's Department, all of them here, you see them around the back of the room. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for, for doing this. Now. By the way, thank you for the introduction. I don't ever get an introduction. That was kind of neat. Ordinarily, I just walk out and stop talk, start talking. Um, this is, this is what we'll do. Some of you have seen this before. Uh, it's changed a little bit. We try and change a little bit every week as more of the information becomes available. So if you've seen it, uh, uh, the presentation before, you'll see some uh, old information but some new. Basically, it's about half an hour worth of information that we'll go over. And then at the end, I'll shut up and answer questions for pretty much as long as you all want to, uh, to sit around. I think when we did this in, in Rock Hill, we did questions for almost an hour and a half, maybe two hours. Um, and I will take all of the questions. Uh, those folks here who want to talk today about um, Medicare, Medicaid, and those folks who want to talk about defense spending, I will answer all of the questions that I can that possibly answer. So if you can, please hold your questions until the end. Uh, that might help us move along because you might have your question answered or at least addressed during the presentation. Um, so why are we here? Um, we're here because um, when the election was over, I got a call from Paul Ryan. And Paul said, I understand you'd like to be on the budget committee. And I said, yeah, I'd love to be on the budget committee. And he said, well, what, what are your qualifications? And I said, well, I've got, uh, I've got an undergraduate degree in economics, and I went to Harvard Business School, and I beat the budget chair. And he said, okay, that works. Uh, <laughs> and he said, look, here's the stuff. And I, I went to my staff. We actually built a staff based almost, almost on purpose to deal with the budget. It's what I wanted to do. And I told my staff, listen, I want to know as much about the budget as anybody else in Congress. And they said, we know Paul Ryan's been doing this since he was 20 years old. And I said, okay, everybody in Congress except Paul Ryan. <laughs> and they literally brought me on my second or third day of work a stack of paper that was three and a half feet tall. And they said, here's the introduction. <laughs> and I read it. And as I was reading it, it didn't take long as I got into the stack, but I started telling myself, I had no idea it was this bad. And I'm relatively confident that no one back home had any idea that it was this bad. And I need to go home and start telling people this. And that's what this is. Um, and actually, the very first thing that I remember seeing was this quotation. Um, and I've been in politics enough to know that if if that had been from a politician of either party, a Republican, or Democrat, it was John Boehner who said that, or if it was Nancy Pelosi who said that, I would probably have moved on to the next piece of paper and, and not paid much attention to it because I could dismiss it as hyperbole. It wasn't John Boehner and it wasn't Nancy Pelosi. It was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. And that really got my attention. Um, when the guy with the guns tells us that the number one threat to our national security is our debt, now you have my attention. And I hope it gets yours. And I hope it sets the tone for what you're going to see tonight because it's not fun. It's not easy. Um, you can imagine what things have to get to for the, for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs to say that in a public report to Congress. Um, and indeed, it's, it's, it's not very pleasant. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the, 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 the upsides and the, the, the lights at the end of the tunnel as we go through. But for the most part, this is pretty serious and not uplifting stuff. One of the things I realized when I was getting into this and going through that stack of paper was that I couldn't understand the numbers. My mind would get numb to them. Uh, you talk about you know, hundreds of millions and tens of billions and 1.6 trillion, and I know that those numbers are different, and I know that they're really big, but I don't really, I can't grasp them. Um, so I asked my staff to do something to help me understand the numbers, and I think in turn it's allowed me to explain the numbers in a fashion that, uh, that most folks understand. I want you to imagine something. I want you to imagine who's, who's married here. 
I want to make a You, sir, I want you to imagine that you are at home with your wife. And you haven't done a budget in a while, because things were pretty good for a good bit of time. And maybe you had a budget, but you didn't pay much attention to it, but you really didn't sit down and do a budget. But this year, things started to tighten up a little bit. So now you and your wife have sat down in early January to do the family budget for real. And you look at everything you make, and you make $46,000 a year. That's what you take home after taxes. And then you bring in your car payment and your insurance and the mortgage or the rent and your grocery bills and the gas bills and everything. You lay that on the table, and you are spending $78,000 a year. And that will make you, that'll sort of make you, you know, Bucker up a little bit. Um, so you're spending 46, excuse me, you're making 46 and you're spending 78. And then your wife turns to you and goes, did you get the visa bill last month? And you said, yes, I did. And the visa bill is $281,000. Okay? This is where we are as a nation. The $46,000 equates to the $2.3 trillion that we will bring in this year in revenue. The seventy-eight, excuse me, the seventy-eight thousand dollars in expenditures is the three point nine trillion dollars in, 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 in money that we will spend, and the two hundred eighty-one thousand dollars is the fourteen trillion dollars in debt that we have. This is where we are as a nation. So you can imagine, sir, if you're having that conversation with your wife, what it would feel like at your house. You sort of know what my first five months in Congress has been like. Um, we do this, by the way, not only to tell people how bad it is, but also to tell people how hard it is to fix. We'll come back to this and get it again. Because everybody calls me all the time and says, well, what if, you, uh, what if we cut the foreign aid budget? What if we just don't give money to countries we don't like? Okay, that's great, but as we try to save $32,000, that only saves about $800. So we're going to find the other $31,000 that we're trying to save. We'll talk more about that as we go on. So but one of the first things we did is change the numbers. You hear a lot of things on the internet about your government. Some of it is true, some of it is uh, half true, half false, some of it is false. One of the things you hear is that we borrow 42 cents of every dollar that we spend. This is true, uh, and has been true for, I think, the last couple of years. Another thing you hear is that we borrow all of our money from China. This is not true. Last year, we borrowed about half of our money from overseas. 47% is actually about 49% this year, but roughly half. And half of that came from China. So China does lend us about 25 cents out of every dollar that we borrow. The other half comes from domestic sources. Um, all domestic sources are not created equal, and we'll talk about that more as we talk about gas prices. But if you hear that we're borrowing all of our money from China, it's technically not true. We borrow about 25 cents of every dollar. But that is still so much money that every single week we pay China enough money in interest to buy three of the new joint strike players. You're starting to get a sense, maybe, for why Admiral Mullen said what he did about the debt's relationship to our national security. I'll take it to another level, and I'll do it as an example of, of the, 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 the tangled web that we have woven, not as an example of what's happening in the world of international relations. Okay, so this is not a comment on Taiwanese or Chinese policies. But we have a treaty with Taiwan. We've agreed to defend Taiwan if they were attacked by China. If Taiwan were attacked by China tomorrow, we would have to borrow money from the Chinese in order to protect the Taiwanese from the Chinese. So you start to see, I mean, we've all heard it since we were little kids, you know, you get in trouble when you borrow too much money, and especially when you don't know who you're borrowing money from. You borrow money from people who might not have the same national interests as you do. Um, so I give that as an example of one of the challenges that this debt creates for us. <coughs> Uh, some of you may have seen this graph before uh, nationally. I think Paul used it, Mr. Ryan used this on his uh, response to the State of the Union. But this was the second thing that I saw that, that really grabbed my attention um, when I went through that original uh, three and a half foot stack. That is the historical average of our debt. And keep in mind when we talk today about the size of the debt and the deficits, I try not to talk about it in terms of dollar figures when we look at historical numbers because a dollar today is not the same as a dollar right after World War I or two, World War II. So we talk about it in terms of relative to the overall economy, over, or relative to the GDP. So what you see down the left side of this graph is the, uh, relative to the size of our economy. And you can see that right at the end of World War II, our debt stood at 100% of the size of the economy. And it came down pretty dramatically until the early 1980s when it started trending up. And it came back down again during the uh, mid to late 1990s. Um, and that's where we are today. That's the end of World War II. 
This is the future. By the way, this is a good time for me to tell you that most of the numbers that you see today are not Democrat numbers, they are not Republican numbers, they are numbers from the Congressional Budget Office. These are numbers from the Congressional Budget Office. Whenever I show you partisan numbers, I will try and go back and make sure I tell you the numbers are partisan. These are not. This is from the group of uh, accountants and uh, actuaries that are employed by Congress and provide raw data to both parties. The frightening thing about this is, this is what is going to happen if we do nothing. This is not a prediction about future dramatic changes in policy. This is simply the law of the land as it exists today, applied to, amongst other things, the demographics of the country today. This is our future. I've been looking very hard for any government that has survived past that 400% line, and I've not found one yet. If anybody, lets, if anybody knows of any, please let me know. I don't like to tell people stuff that's not right, but we, I've asked this question at many of the college campuses of many professors, and they haven't found one yet either. We've not been able to find a government that can survive past that 400% line. Um, this is what keeps me up. And it keeps me up because government is better at not doing things than it is at doing things. And if we don't do anything, this is the future. This is what we give to our kids uh, and our grandkids. Um, and that is the thing that uh, uh, probably strike, uh, frightens me the most. People ask me all the time, this is just by way of reference, uh, how long will it be until we're as bad off as Europe? And as you can see here, in a lot of ways, we're actually worse off than some of the countries in Europe right now. Uh, overall debt, uh, relative to the size of the economic output or the size of one's economy, uh, our debt is actually bigger than Germany, Spain, the rest of the Eurozone, almost as big as Ireland's. And then measured in terms of the tax revenue that you bring every, every single year, we're worse off than Ireland, Germany, and Spain as well. So in many, many ways, uh, we are actually deeper in the hole now than the countries that you, that you see on TV and read about in the newspapers. Who's to blame? This is the part that really disappoints my Republican friends and really excites my Democrat friends. If y'all came to see uh, a political rally tonight, you came to the wrong place. Uh, this is not a rah-rah job for the Republican Party, because we are as much to blame as anybody else. Um, this started in the 1980s. As a matter of fact, this is actually a better way to look at it. This is the debt ceiling in terms of real dollars. Not total dollars, but real dollars adjusted for inflation. And as you can see, we did a pretty good job from the end of World War II up until about 1982 in terms of keeping our overall debt relative to the size of our economy pretty stable. And then in 1982, politicians of both parties, we had a Republican president, a Democrat controlled Congress, figured out that they could borrow a lot of money and you and I really wouldn't care that much. And that's exactly what we've been doing for the last 30 years. We did not get in the situation that you're going to learn about tonight overnight. Now certainly there are things I have disagreed with vehemently in the last two, two years under the current administration, but it would not be anywhere close to fair to say that this problem came up in the last two years. In fact, I'm going to talk very favorably about one of the few times that we actually fixed this in the last 30 years, and it was during the Clinton administration. You can give credit to the Democrat president if you like. You can give credit to the Republican Congress if you like. But the truth of the matter is that under the Clinton administration, we actually made some improvement on this, and I'll talk about that more. You can see it on the graph, by the way. That comes down in the late 1990s. Um, both parties are to blame, and given the size of the situation that we are in, it's hard to imagine that you could blame any one party to begin with. People ask me, where does the money go? And you hear uh, a lot of different terms. One of the terms you hear us talk about in Washington is discretionary spending versus mandatory spending. Mandatory spending is also called entitlement spending. I call it something else. I call it automatic spending or autopilot spending. We set a budget in Congress every single year. Okay? We set a budget, but we don't set a budget for all government expenditures. We only set a budget for the green box and the red, excuse me, the green slice of the pie, the red slice of the pie, the two discretionary parts of the budget. We set what the Defense Department can spend every single year. We also set what we'll spend on education, health and human services, the USDA, uh, the FAA, everything. Those are all discretionary expenditures, and we set a budget on that every single year. Together, the two discretionary parts of the budget make up about 40%. The other parts, the mandatory spending, again, what I call the automatic spending, uh, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, debt interest, and other mandatory, we do not set the budget for every single year. That money gets spent automatically. When you turn 65, you get your Medicare benefits. And that happens by automatic, that happens by operation of law. 